Welcome to February 9th, regular Board of Education meeting. Can we do a roll call, please? Sure. Mr. Albany? Yes. Mr. Mickey? Yes. Mr. Dutt? Yes. Mrs. Scouted? Yes. And Mr. White? Yes. And Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand for Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Yes. Mr. Duck? Yes. Mrs. Cowden? Yes. Mr. White? Yes. All right. Motion to approve the minutes from last meeting. Was, um, were these minutes, did, were they just the organizational meeting or was it the regular meeting that preceded it? Or, should be, only the organist meeting is in there. Um, Let me see if we look into it for a second. The regular board is the attached one. Oh, if you click on the view meeting minutes, okay. yeah. All right, I see it there now. One second, Lord. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Oh, I'm sorry. We didn't get much. I moved to the Buckeye Valley Board of Education to approve the attachments <coughs> on the recommendation of the treasurer. Thank you. Second that motion. Roll call. Michelle Looney? Yes. Mr. Mickey? Yes. Mrs. Dutt? Yes. Mrs. Scalvin? Yes. And Mr. White? Yes. All right. Our first public comment is on any of the agenda items. I don't know if y'all can see that. I don't have any. You don't have any for the agenda items. Okay. And on to the district update. Thank you. Um, big day for me. This is the. We did have somebody that It wasn't on a no, agenda item, so we'll read it at the end. There's a comment at the period at the end. Okay. I just don't want to forget that. So last few months, year and a half, long COVID updates. This is uh, my COVID updates have gotten uh, dramatically shorter after some of the guidance we, we've had recently. So um, going forward, uh, starting last week, we are only now um, reporting cases that are called into us. So we're not having to um, get them verified through the health department any longer. So throughout the week, this is for um, two, four, we had 10 student cases and three district cases. Um, and again, all this is, is anybody that calls in during the week that um, they're out due to COVID, we are counting that. So there's no longer any isolation letter being sent. 
um, for school exposure or cases from the health department any longer. It is um, just a weekly update on what we're doing. So this is how we're going to record that. Um, no more letters are going home to families now. Everything is going to be um, found here on our website through the, the dashboard. Again, it's just a positive, no quarantines, no exposures or anything like that, um, which leads to some of our mitigation strategies. We are really at this point only doing um, sanitation at this sanitizing at the schools. Um, so we are concentrating on that, but one way hallways no longer happening. Um, we are um, slowly letting visitors and stuff into the building. So um, we're, we're inching closer to to normal. So I, if you guys want the, the COVID updates going forward, it'll be on the, the web and it'll just be a quick thing I can touch on for you guys during the, the board meetings. Um, next, before I turn it over to Mr. O, is a policy update. We are, during COVID, we've kind of backed up on our, our policies, so I'm reviewing those. Um, one of the, the big ones I want to, to review and then get you guys for first readings for next month is our um, anti-discrimination policy. It needs some updating, so I'm, I'm working on that, and I'll have that to you guys um, next month for um, prior to next month's meeting for the, the first reading. So that's all I have, and uh, turn over to, to Mr. O for a brief strategic plan update, and um, then he'll follow himself up with a our literature review and selection process. Notice. There we go. Notice Jeremy said a brief strategic plan overview. So Ian, Ian Kelly Limited needs no more than an hour. Um, so a strategic plan overview. This is just an overview of the process that we went through and um, what we're doing in the district right now with the strategic plan. So this started back in fall of 2020 with a series of four retreats. Um, it was a total of 12 hours that we um, got together for this initiative, um, and the board adopted it in February 20, uh, 2021. The committee had nine district leaders on it, nine staff members, seven community members, two students, and two board of education members. We looked at some key considerations, which was student academic data. We had a student survey and focus groups. This student survey had been done by the board, I believe in 2019. 2020, February. February 2020. So that was used as part of this, and also the district portrait of the graduate, um, which had been developed about two years prior to the strategic plan. This is the end result, um, you know, it's small up there. Board, we have copies. Um, this isn't new, but the, in the end, we came up with the Buckeye Valley School District 2020 and Beyond Strategic Plan with a revised mission and vision statement as part of this and some of our core beliefs. From then, so at that point, that was presented to the board. The board adopted it. Um, and, and I remember Mr. White was sort of like, well, now what? And so this will sort of get into the, what we've done, what it sends. So from there, we had some strategic planning core team subgroup meetings, and that's a lot to say. But basically, people that were on the strategic plan committee decided, hey, this is an area I'm interested in. So we ended up having the subgroups based on um, our four areas that we broke down into, such as student success. And those groups met um, to come up with the goals and action items for those areas. The administrative retreats were held in June and August, and that was the time where directors um, and the superintendent and principals all worked together um, on the plan as well. So it came out these goal area action steps. Let me zoom in a little bit more. So each goal area has one of these action steps. So for this one, the example is the student success. So you can see we have the district mission there, uh, and vision. We have ongoing initiatives. So this was a big thing. You don't see this in all strategic plans, but there are a lot of things that the district had going. There were initiatives that we didn't want to see forgotten, especially things that could um, start either before COVID hit or during COVID. It's like, we don't want to let go of this. 
So it didn't need a specific action line item, but you can see portrait of graduate. We didn't want to forget about that. Continuing to close gaps for our achievement data. Um, an MTSS framework, which is how we provide intervention to our students. The new graduation and SEALs, which is what we talked about uh, in November. It's rolling out, and then OTIS 2.0, which is the new uh, system for how teachers are evaluated. So it's like we don't want to forget about these. But then under it, we have each strategy. So for this one, strategy one, for example, was that we wanted to expand academic programming and options to increase workforce readiness. And then you can see we have some three action steps. Who's responsible? Evidence and momentum was a new thing that we built in this um, planning period. So this is how would we know if we're successful in this? How do we know if we're measuring progress? And then what the timeline would be. I will note that purposely, most of the timelines begin next school year or further out. This year was what we call a no new initiative initiative year. Uh, we had our, we really wanted our focus to be on getting the kids back into school and then back into the routines and helping them caught up from any learning loss from the online learning. So that was purposeful. If you can go through it, just finish this up. We also had an area called opportunities to consider. So this was sort of uh, after you have a lot of people together, you have a lot of great ideas. And sometimes you uh, don't want to forget what those ideas were as you look. So we have other opportunities, for example, under student success, thinking about gifted and talented programming, how we do scheduling, uh, special education services, figuring out ACT or SAT, all that sort of stuff. So that was noted. And each area has uh, a similar form. From there, so there's the, down to the, the, the big picture is the district plan. Then we have the goal actions, and now school improvement plan. So each building developed their own school improvement plan. This one's the middle school for an example. Same format. Again, action steps, responsibilities, evidence and momentum. Um, all three buildings this year had the same three goals. Again, achievement, increased fidelity of um, social and emotional learning, opening virtual, I'll talk about that in a second and then increase the level of community engagement um, with our school community. So student achievement, of course, that's probably always going to be there. It's, it's something that we want to work on. Specifically this year, again, kids coming back from the pandemic, wanting to help get, keep, get people caught up. The SEL rituals, this is just what this means. It's like when your kids come in, just saying like, hey guys, if you were weather what would the weather that you might be today some activities like that just so the teacher can engage with how the kids are doing that day and help them just reflect on how's my day going is it a good day a bad day if it's a bad day how maybe can i turn it around and do a good one it's a very simple short at the start of the lessons and then the school community again knowing that we kind of have volunteers that have been going for a while because of covid and family events we wanted to increase the amount of um, engagement we are having with, yeah, with the community. Oops. All right, quarterly monitoring. So the schools have these plans put together. I meet uh, with the building principals every quarter and their leadership teams, and we go over what were their goals for their building, what momentum are they um, showing, do they need any support from central office? Um, so we just completed our first round. And then on the final level, the teachers and administrators do professional growth plans with the um, Ohio evaluation system. And they have to tie in the district plans and initiatives and their building goals along with that. So there's alignment. And the end result is hopefully that we are graduating our students with the portrait of the graduate and the skills that were listed. And just for some people understand the joke, and hopefully all the arrows are hitting the same target. I will say, someone in my family is very good at animations. 
if you ask me to do that, I can't take credit for it. So, any credit on uh, questions about strategic plan or the process that we had? Is there any school that needed help from corporate office? Yeah, I mean, right now, um, a big ask, to be honest, working with the instructional component is continued work with gain and substitutes. I know that's not directly to the strategic plan, but when we are short substitutes, staff's pulled and there's usually less time to provide intervention and enrichment. So that's a big ask from all the principals. Um, we've increased our sub pay. We've done a lot of advertisements. Ohio has changed the, the license qualifications. So trying to get in those substitutes. Does um, it, it help? Does it increase? It's gone better since winter break. Um, but is, do we have a fill rate every day now? No. Um, we also look at increasing how we're helping kiddos that have mental health needs. That's a common area in that SEL area, um, how we're helping address kids with that, and our outside service providers. Any other questions on that, Amy? Um. I'm going to get a quick drink while you ask. Okay. Go for it. On the previous slide, you had where the teacher, oh, the, uh, the teacher has to uh, fill out the growth plan and then, yes. now does that uh, become part of her uh, uh, job performance review? Of, okay, you had three things you're going to improve on, but maybe only you're able to accomplish one in the school year. So, I mean, we we counting balls and strikes with this or? So that's a good question. So how this goes, if, if someone is rated and accomplished at their, for their rubric, then this is a self-directed process. They make their own goals and they have to be aligned to building their district goals, but it's their, it's their show principal needs for them to support them and there's a mid-year check-in. If they're skilled, the principal and the teacher work together on that goal. And if they're developing, then the evaluator guides this process and helps support the teacher through it. If they were at the level below that, then it's actually not a growth plan, it's an um, improvement plan. The improvement plan is written by the administrator. So that's how that works. I'll also say, um, in terms of the board's role, you each have, as you know from the last name, you each signed up for one of the four subgroups. Um, and those groups meet at least annually. Depends on what's going on with the district and what's going on with the goal in terms of how frequently. A lot of times for student success, for example, this year, we met and had a game plan for the year, and the goal for the year is to carry it out. And if any major changes would take place, we would involve the people that are on our subgroups. Uh, but otherwise, it, it's for us to make sure that there's momentum going in that whole group. And how are those divvied up? I mean, so everybody, every instructor comes up with her, is there her own goals? Or is there like a goal that all, everybody in fact, on the faculty would uh, work on? So for this year, let me talk about this year real quick and then get into a normal year. So this year, a couple odd things. We haven't had a lot of state, state data for the last few school years because of the pandemic. And also this was the first year of the OTES 2.0. Before that we were OTES 1.0. And we were doing no initiative initiative. So because of that, most teachers in the district this year have the same goal and that was to familiarize themselves with the new OTES.0 system, which includes a whole new rubric. So for a teacher, they need to know, hey, where do I think I'm rated? There's a rubric. Um, and we want them to be familiar with that as they're being evaluated on it. For a normal year, what happens is an evaluator goes in, teacher gets feedback, and then together you decide, hey, here's an area that I, you know, the teacher that, here's the area I want to work on. Um, and there's a conversation, and then that becomes part of the driver, driving force of this plan the next school year. 
with this new process, a teacher can develop this plan at the end of the school year or the beginning of the next school year. So if a teacher this May is like, hey, I have you know, my, my student data is fresh in my head, I know where I want to go with things next year, I want to plan about over it the summer, they can go ahead and write their plan at the end of the school year and have it approved. Does that help? Yeah. So the whole goal is to have alignment. Um, and it can be, I think the big key in here, again, with Mr. White's comments uh, from last year when this was adopted, it, it needs to be a relevant document. It needs to be updated through time. Because things pop up that you don't anticipate and needs to come up. So it needs to be a flexible document that we look at and make revisions to. Any other questions on that, Amy? Yes. Where would it? Is this posted so everybody can see it? And how do we communicate more about it? So it's on it's on the district website, okay. and I know when it was first adopted by the board, it was communicated out to the community. Um, I think in starting next year, I think it would be nice. I know we're launching a new website this summer. And it would be nice with that reorganization. Each building could easily have their building plan uh, listed on the website. The buildings are also becoming um, more so that, like the PTOs, for example, if the buildings are involved with this process as well, have some representation. But I know you and I have talked before. I think as time goes on, we'll be better able to. Um, with our metrics of how we're doing. Um, the COVID really did throw off data in terms of metrics because there was a pause for a couple of years and the kids have all dipped right now. Um, so that evidence and momentum, I think is important. But as we start having our kids back and the data becomes more consistent, it's easy, it's easy <coughs> to create like a dashboard to show growth on some of those areas. When should the, yeah, a dashboard or scorecard, that would yeah. be great, something really visual. And I'll say it depends, you know, your strategic plan helps drive how you're showing your growth. So, you know, if you're purely based, if you're purely going to be looking at student achievement, it's very easy to have like a color coded dashboard. In this case, a lot of the priority when we did the strategic plan was things like partnerships with uh, businesses for internships, more um, career development in the elementary. And those are things that are hard to just quantify with a number. So that's a little bit more of where you're having an evidence of here's a program we put in place, here's portfolios put in place. Um, so it depends on, I think, where, where the goals were of the board in terms of how easy it is to um, put a number to it. And right now, I definitely think it's more having evidence. And what would be the board's involvement or the community involvement in this move forward? Frequency, the process of So typically these are, are done every five years. The, in terms of the, the periodic achievement. Would it be an annual thing that we want to look at? Or? So I think having an annual, um, actually the buildings, you know, have their time of year spent. <coughs> and next year when we start having trend data, the buildings could during their presentation, share where they are with their plan. I think that would be a great time to help highlight that. But typically, the plans are refreshed every five years. Again, we're trying to be more proactive and refresh it uh, more frequently as things come up, but making sure that our targets still remain clear. We don't want to keep switching initiatives, switching programs. Um, that's something we really want to make sure that we're cautious to not I put down the road. So I, I appreciate having this because even right now when we're thinking about staffing for next year and meeting with principals, um, you know, conversation comes back to what's in the strategic plan and where do we want to put our priorities. Because of course, just like any public school, we could have um, there's a lot of things you can do, and it's important to try to make sure that the board, administration, teachers, parents, community, all understand the direction so we can support each other. It would be nice if we could communicate this 
better. I don't think. Absolutely. Um, Any other questions about the process? Okay. Right, real quick. I, board, I just, we're about to go into the literature review. We've had a couple, um, I guess, concerns from the community about um, curricular literature type things. So this is where the, this review has come from. So Ms. Warner has headed that up. Yeah. He's been meeting with his committee. And I just wanted him to review the process of um, how we're, we're going to go forward with reviewing um, literature, selecting some of those things, and making sure that it's relevant, has choice, and presents both sides. So. I said, it's the day my throat's been dry all day that I have two presentations. So, you know. <laughs> um, all right, so literature review and selection process. This one's a little bit more of a fun one, maybe than strategic planning. I don't know. Um, all right. So literature review and selection process. This is a, pro a process that we actually started a few months ago, as, as Dr. Froelich said. Um, probably a response to something we needed to do anyways, but we also want to help address community concerns in this area. So we want to make sure our materials are aligned to standards, provide transparency, Increase parent and guardian support of teachers in the district. Listen to and recognize values and opinions within the community and align with district policies and expectations. Lastly, we want to help provide uh, some guidance and support for our teachers with a selection framework. Uh, and that's basically, as we know, we want uh, to support our teachers as well and just asking them to select some of their own material without. Um, support behind that is a tricky place to put a teacher. So phase one was November through December of last year. And the CIAs, um, those are four people um, that we have in the district. They're sort of my team. They're called curriculum instruction and assessment coordinators. So those are teachers on special assignments. There's one in each building. Uh, and that's new this year, and they helped me with a curriculum audit of all of our primary teaching resources. We didn't have a list, so if someone said, Brian, what are you using to teach social studies at the middle school? I didn't know, or when it was adopted. I don't know. Um, we actually had a surprise that the music curriculum came up, um, and it was all of a sudden shut off, and it was because it was, it would just run its subscription, and I didn't know that. Um, so we need to get a handle on that, and it also went together with this selection process. So K through 12, we, um, they met with all the teachers in the district. What do you teach? Uh, use the teacher course um, for all subject areas. So now we have a master list of that. We also know there's a few areas that like we never bought them anything. So now we can look at how we can better support them. Phase two is the phase that we're currently in. So I want to keep emphasizing that. This is mid committee work. Um, so some of this is definitely draft. I don't, I don't want to say that we went ahead of the committee on this, but this is the direction that we're going. So the committee has 11 teacher leaders on it, K through 12, and we're researching and refining a process for how teacher selected material will be reviewed and selected for instruction. <laughs> so again, this is a draft. So what this is looking at is if a material is neutral, and there's no controversial issue identified, then they can use the material in the lesson. Um, as simple as that. So we, you know, this is thing about the boxcar children or diary of a diary of a wimpy kid. Folks like that, there's not a controversial issue, and we certainly have no problem with the teacher using their books. If the material is possibly controversial, and the teacher's thinking, I'm not really sure. And then we would ask them to have a colleague review the material. And if it's decided it's not controversial, then they could use it in their lesson. If it's like, you know what, we're thinking this might be controversial, or it is controversial, then the teacher should make a decision. Do I really need to use this material? Of all the materials out there, is it really necessarily necessary to use this one? If it is, the teacher will. Uh, a rationale form that we found a few examples of that we will begin developing and turn that into the principal. The principal would review and make a final determination. If it would be determined to be used, 
then what would need to happen is there need to be a choice of other reading material, and that choice would need to not be something controversial. The parent and guardians would need to be notified within that class, and any material would need to present both sides of an issue uh, if the controversial item is an issue. Additional guidance that we're considering. If material covers a current event, a teacher must ask a colleague to review the material. So no is answer buts. If it's something currently happening in the news, it's a common topic on social media and newspapers, political debates, we would want them to say, hey, to a colleague, can you review this for me? Is there anything controversial? And this comes from, you know, I've been having conversations with teachers, and a few will say, listen, when we did XYZ, I didn't know it was controversial. I've used it for three or four years, and I wasn't aware. And all of a sudden, now I'm sort of getting some heat on this. Um, so this helps put a blanket in there that you can have a colleague look it over for a second set of eyes. If it does address a current event in the subject of controversy, that they would need to do one of those rationale forms and you could give it to the principal to see if there's approval. A recommendation I have is if a material covers an event in history, that the content and scope should align to Ohio's learning standards for social studies. So that would help give some parameters um, of what we cover, especially in the English language arts classroom. Um, when they do pick books, they do want students to engage uh, in debate, to experience cultures other than, other, other than their own, different opinions. But it's a historical event. Look at the social studies standards. Is it covered in those standards? And if not, then that would not be an appropriate book to use. And then make sure there's communication with parents and guardians, which is essential to the homeschool partnership. And I think that this would not have been, uh, be applicable to a current events course, because clearly if it's a current events course, they would need to be discussing current events. Questions on this one, in terms of the additional guidance, if you want to pause here, Mr. White. Uh, in the, uh... I forget what the state calls it. It's their standard uh, curriculum program. They started a couple of years ago. They had listed in there certain pieces of literature that, as examples of, if you use this and in the course, then it's kind of like implied that state says that's an okay thumb cell type of piece of literature. Are those, I mean, there's like a handful of each one, are those kind of given the, the free pass that say the state said it's good, we can go ahead and use it, or we still got to go through the review process? You know, I wouldn't give anything a free pass, to be honest. Um, and that's, I, I've worked in many, you know, a, a few different districts in my career, and I just, it comes down to a local community and local. Um, community community values and the makeup of that community, you have to have your pulse on the community to know what materials are appropriate. So there's nothing that I would just blanket say is is, um, is fine. Uh, you know, we, I would even say, even if the district purchases uh, a material for teachers, that you still have to know, first of all, you have to know, it has to be customized for your kids no matter what. So if it's below where your kids are that year, above where they are, if it's not in the interest of your kids that you have in your classroom, teachers need to change and modify that anyways, and our good teachers do. Which is what makes this actually a complicated process. And I think we can all understand that. That the notion of having a list of 20 books that you can use, for example, in a certain grade, it just makes it hard because good teachers do get to know their kids and where their levels are, and they make uh, decisions based on that. So one year you might use a book that you may never use again because those kids that year really loved that topic. So we don't want to 
I don't want to have a process in place that makes it so restrictive from teachers that they can't customize things for their kids. But I also want a process in place that supports the teachers and they know that, uh, hey, there's a framework I can follow and if I follow that framework, I'm okay. Um, and then also for the community to trust that, hey, you know, the school has a process in place, they do respect our values, and my kid has choices if there's a book that doesn't meet what our value is. So it's that delicate balance that we're really trying to meet here with this. <coughs> Questions on this page? <coughs> I wanted to ask, um, if a subject is found to be controversial, you talked about, you know, how you go through the different steps and then uh, you notify the parents and all that. So what do you do when you notify the parents and they have a problem with it? What? So they would, I mean, first of all, they would be offered an alternative choice um, and it would need to be to make sure that that alternative wasn't didn't near the same thing that they had an objection of if that makes sense I'm, I'm not so, understanding. Yeah. Yeah. So, what you're saying is if a certain book is not acceptable to two parents are we getting rid of that whole book or are we saying just for your student read this instead saying in those in, in those situations <coughs> there would be two options and my recommendation would be that one not be the alternative, but hey, here's two books we're going to be teaching. And let the parents know when we're talking about parent notification, here's two, here's the theme we're doing, here's why these books are selected, here's book A, book B, and they can have a choice uh, from the parent and yeah. student side. But I guess what I'm saying is if the community or the parents don't like that book, what is the path to getting that changed other than you, get, you have two choices? Copy that. So first of all, their kids would not be using that book if they didn't want it, but we also, in the next phase, um, are going to work on development of a process to submit concern for feedback so a parent knows where they can go um, and we know who will review that concern. Yeah, because I think a lot of times the people in the community may not have children in the school, but they don't want the children in the schools to read read a certain book. Absolutely. Or something like that. And, and I was also wondering, is there a place that we can go to look up those materials? Is, and is there a place where we can look up library books, things like that? So right now, I don't think there's an inventory of like with the library books or anything that's all online. But we do have... Uh, all of our libraries do have a you know electronic system to check out books, so it is possible to pull an inventory of what's in the. Anybody in the building to do that, right? Yeah, or they could just pull, and you can pull it and turn it into a PDF. Um, well, I mean, if I wanted to see if my favorite book is in the library, how do I do that? In are you from a student or a parent? As a parent, you would. I would just email the school librarian and ask if they have the book. They would tell you. Um, we also help families sometimes get books from the Delaware system. Um, if we don't have a book in our library and a kid really wants, then we can help work with there and they'll help lend to the Delaware County system. Okay, so for now, if they disagree with something, who should they talk to until we get the system in place? They, people have been contacting me and they're welcome to continue. Um, it's been good conversation on all that. So I'll say I've been having conversations with people since this summer, and and the community definitely has, um, you know, every household is different and, and has different wants and needs on this. So it's trying to come up with a balance that's respectful to all the sides and acknowledges. I think it would be challenging if you have a if you're doing a controversial subject. And then the only other option would be a non-controversial book. Well, and that's kind of what's the point. Yeah. And where that comes from was some some parents had concern that hey, um, this was a subject matter I was uncomfortable with, and the alternative text was a different author. It was a different maybe style, but it was still the same topic. 
so if my concern is that topic, and I don't think that's the right topic for my family at this time, then certainly it's not appropriate to have the alternative be the same topic. Well, but I'm here, yeah. I mean, I, I, go ahead. But I'll also add to the course descriptions at the high school um, a disclaimer that this particular course could contain controversial. If it's an elective, mm -hmm. a parent would or a student would have an opportunity to find another elective they want to. Um, and again, for core classes that are required, we're going to focus on making sure those standards are, are what are addressed and we don't go outside the standard. It seems like with the core classes, there's got to be a way to um, educate the state standards without even having to venture into controversial issues. Yeah. I mean, there's so much material out there. There's got to be a way to avoid the majority of that, even and I just having a set set standard this is what you can teach from i mean yeah i don't want to have to micromanage my child's education Absolutely. i want to just trust that the school is going to do a good job and not be bringing controversial potentially controversial issues um, to my kids unless they are in an elective where i was aware of that uh, at which point i would know and have to be okay with it yes. but i feel like for the core classes I mean, is there a way to not even have controversial issues in those core classes? Well, this committee will help in that. Yeah, I think what he mentioned is sometimes a teacher doesn't realize it's it's controversial, but if it would came to you, you'd be like, this is number. So I think getting more eyes on it, um, mm -hmm. getting our finger and pulse on it will, will help a lot too. But we, your conversation, same conversation we were having today in our director's meeting on how can we mm -hmm. ensure that this this happens and it, it matches values of our community. That's really what we want to focus on and, and try to get buy-in from, from all the teachers on, on that as well. And that is the hard, and for a teacher perspective, when we have talked this year a lot about the policy, the controversial issue policy, and you know what it, what is controversial, and that's the whole right and the definition. Um, when I we have there's a lawyer through the Educational Service Center who did a presentation to Central Ohio. Um, people in similar positions to mine. And it really it, it comes down to knowing the pulse of your community, what's an active topic. Um, so every community, what could be considered a controversial issue could be different. And it, as, as years go, and um, it could change. You know, I told the committee, I said, I remember when I started teaching, Harry Potter was a controversial issue. And I did not dare having Harry Potter books in my classroom. <laughs> and we look back at that now and and think lighthearted about it. Um, so, so being able to be flexible with that and knowing that, again, one family's controversial issue might differ a little from their neighbors and distinguishing that from the community as a whole. So it's not an easy piece to put together. Um, but it's been a good conversation, and I'm glad we're starting to have this conversation and start to figure it out. Um, so the focus on the core courses will be on the standards. I think that will yes. help a lot to avoid that, that yes. controversial discussion. And the, the piece about social studies, you know, again, um, I think that helps some of the, some of the concerns in there as well. Um, for example, like critical race theory is not in you know, Ohio's standards for social studies. So this would not um, a book that was a critical race theory and not fit into the content and scope of that. Go ahead. You had said to people to reach out to you, but we have these policy that says when when people have concerns or they try to talk to the teacher, let them know, and then the principal Absolutely. and the superintendent. But for these topics, when we communicate to people, do we say that we want them to copy you because you're working on it right now? Yeah, and, and Mr. Albuni had talked about, like, like, if I want to know what books were in the library or something, that definitely reach out to me and I can help facilitate that. But yeah, if you are a parent and you have a question about what's going on in your child's classroom, I would definitely start with the teacher for sure. Um, and make sure there's clarification and, and work through that. And then if not, go to the principal, and then I can become involved. Um, the teachers are very well aware of this. 
have been working hard, especially at the high school, to communicate out, hey, we have a new unit coming up. This is the book we're going to be working on. This is why we selected this book. Um, so that's been a very thoughtful process. Um, so I would encourage parents, first of all, to start there, but always feel free to CC me because um, it helps us as we're thinking about this process. Mr. White? Yeah. Um, not just asking, but all books in the library. Yes. Are those being reviewed also? So right now they're not part of this. Part of where we're starting is like books that teachers actually give children as part of instruction. Um, the school libraries we view at as a little bit more, you know, that's self-choice. It goes in there. No one is um, asking them to choose certain books or certain topics, but that's more of a free choice area. Um, so we try to have books that, again, represent um, lots of different viewpoints so that kids can self-select what matches their interests and their family values. Well, it's just, the books are in the library. So they're available for them to use as reference material if they're working on a paper or something. Absolutely. So it's not like these books are over here. Yeah. You may or may not be able to see them. We're not we're what? into segregating books and we're putting an R or a GP on them. Or something Absolutely. Like that. And I would also say the big elephant in the room with all of this is kids and the internet and access to whatever they want pretty much 24 seven. And um, us also trying to make sure that they are responsible consumers of the material that they have at their grasp being in today's age with the internet. So phase three was make sure there's a, a development of a process to submit concerns and feedback. Phase four would be communication and education. So internally, we will want to make sure that uh, the expectations and the process is clear, clearly explained to the teachers. Um, we would I'm planning on a, a presentation on controversial issues just so teachers feel comfortable knowing what, what that means here. And then external, we would definitely want to communicate the process once all said and done to parents so they understand what to expect. Any other questions on on where we are with this? Again, we're mid. We're in the middle of committee work with this. Um, I can give an update to the board as we finish our work, or direction or guidance too. It's helpful to have that. When do you want to be done? Well. Um, I, I want to have this done and laid out so it's, it's um, ready to roll for next school year for the teachers. Um, again, people are already aware to be cautious of this um, and cognizant of it, but I would like the formal process to be ready to go. Um, and hopefully so teachers know, because in the summer, teachers usually spend a lot of their time thinking about the units and lessons they'll have the following school year. So I would like them to know what the process is before they go into the summer. Any other questions or comments or thoughts? Thank you, Brian. All right, thank you guys. And that's the end of the uh, district update. motion to approve the financial report. I move that we approve the financial report for uh, I guess the eighth month of uh, January. I'll second that motion. Okay. Um, this is the month of January reconciliation. <clears throat> Couldn't find nine cents for two days. I'm a little crazy, but I found it. So life is good. Good to sleep again. So um so attaches the grass. <coughs> um and again there's no no major issues. Five to nine cents. 
That's my issue. And this is everything from, are you going to so what you do talk about? about what, yeah. Okay. So if you do a motion and then the second, and then usually that will go to motion. Okay. I'll move to the Pocket Valley Board of Education, approves agenda items 5 1 through 5 13. I'll second. All right, nothing too crazy on here, but I'll run through everything um, really quickly. First, I just want to say this is not the Delaware Ace High. It is a uh, representative Cincinnati Bengals, so I'm hopefully going to be by the Super Bowl, so go Bengals there. Um, I'm rooting for Fog on Monday. Um, but the first th thing we have is um, a donation for the boys' uh, it's like soccer and basketball for $2,000. We have classified employment, so we have a couple of cooks and a, a preschool driver. We've been struggling to fill these positions, so we, we feel fortunate to, to get these filled. Um, the next is uh, we've had a substitute custodian come in, so we're excited about that. We are very short on classified subs. Um, we've had a couple resignations there. Um, basketball, uh, preschool bus driver, we have a, a teacher that's husband was relocated um, and to help with the high school basketball, we had a middle school basketball um, resignation to, to move up there. Um, we have a retirement, Ms. Ansley, um, sixth grade middle school teacher, has done a fantastic job for us. She is um, going to retire after um, this school year. Um, we will have her back at the end of the, hopefully the end of the school year to recognize her and, and thank her for all she's done. Then we have the Supplemental, so mostly spring sports, but we got a couple of fall sports in there. Um, the volunteers, again, mostly coaches. I think they're um, all coaches. We have an overnight trip for the baseball, softball. That's just something the board approves. There's no cost to the district. Parents will provide transportation. Um, each team has raised the money for, for that. But they'll be going um, out of state for spring break, um, baseball, softball games. Um, next thing is the Ohio High School Athletic Association membership. Every year we have to um, do a resolu resolution to um, join the Ohio High School um, Athletic Association, follow their rules and bylaws. So that's a, an annual thing we're doing. Um, the next thing is tax rate from the county. Um, Kelly, anything that? So the county, once they um, evaluate, they put the um, assignment bills for the properties, values, and then they give us the established rates for the. 21 year that they finished, then the board approved it, and then they obviously estimate the revenue that we're receiving from the property tax. And for us, they're on a calendar year, we're on a fiscal year, so that revenue tax is split between two fiscal years for us. And then 5.12 is the contract for the superintendent search, um, which I believe you guys will be talking to them in the executive session. And then 5.13 is all the board policies that I gave you guys last meeting to review. This is the official first reading. So as you read through there and have any suggestions, please email them to me or email them to Amy um, and we can kind of make adjustments as, as we need to. Any questions on those items? That's just an annual thing that we. Yeah, that it's not very much. Or the, all the uh, fees. Fees. No, it's it's minimal. Um, we have, I think, golf, bowling, some of those 
um, sports charge a, a fee, but it, it's for the postseason tournaments. It's minimal. I think it was less than two thousand dollars for the entire year for everything. So. Oh, yeah. Yep, I got that. I'll send that out um, to everybody just to have them view. I think Jeff's comment was to on the drug or tobacco to add other um, non drug drugs, so the huffing and stuff like that. So it just encompassed everything that um, could be associated with the drugs. Can't cover drugs, cigarettes, alcohol, cigarettes, smoking. Kind of a gap there. It covered all of the it covered things that you could use, like using a bait device. But there wasn't anything in there that said, "Well, what if I decide I want to fake paint dinner?" You know, that's again an abuse of a, a substance, and we wanted to have something. I I felt we needed something in there, but just. Didn't know what the words were. I let them earlier figure it out. I'll get that to them for a preview. We'll get something added. I think that was a good idea. Jeremy, real quick, do we need to have a policy on smoking on district property by staff members and a no tobacco use on district property policy? These are all the OSBA recommendations, so I, we certainly don't have to, but it is so best practice to be redundant. redundant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but. I'll go back and look. Some of those are required policies, and I would assume the um, no smoking on by staff is a required policy that we have to have. Any other questions? Thank you. Any discussion on any of these items? Roll call. Mr. Albuni? Yes. Mr. Vicky? Yes. Scott? Yes. Mrs. Scowman? Yes. And Mr. White? Yes. And now we're on to discussion. discussion. Jeremy, do you have that one? Yes. Um, we've talked, there's been some, <clears throat> yeah, um, Cassie's going to pull that up right now. Um, we've had some community concerns regarding the um, Route 23. Um, connector bypass, filler bypass. Um, so they are taking uh, feedback and comments from the public, and I thought it might be a good idea to, to get the board's idea on if we want to do anything. If we do, get your um, idea so that I can formulate a letter and send it in for the uh, public uh, comments so that at least we're on record for how it affects the district. Um, I handed out the PowerPoint the entire PowerPoint from ODOT, and then I also sent out, I pulled out of those the six ideas, the concepts that they have for the, the different bypasses. So um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys for discussion and, and what you'd like me to, to put in a letter um, from the district, or if you feel we need to, to do a letter from the district in favor or opposition or with our preferred suggestion. If, um, if what they're looking at now is the same thing that they had out, gosh, it's been maybe 10, 20 years ago that they, it was going to be called the outer outer belt. And they had us, at one time it was going to go through the middle of the middle school. That's before the middle school was built. But is this a revision of that, or is this just the same old thing? W1. Jeff, they have six alternatives that they are proposing. Um, right here, I pulled those out. So they have one that go to the west side, or I guess two options that, that kind of go to the west side. They don't have any exact routes. They have three options that look like they go through the east side of the district. And then when you have the one that they're just revamping the current Route 23. But, um, looks like the east side options will definitely go through a lot of uh, Buckeye Valley farmland, Buckeye Valley district um, property. And, and so the west side, yes as well, but it does appear that it um, 
may hit some of the Marion schools, uh, North Union, um, but depending on where they're at in that, that shadow, um, we'll, we'll hit quite a bit of the Buckeye Valley. If it's east side of the shadow, that's all Buckeye Valley. If it's the far west side of the shadow, that's um, potentially North Union. Um, yeah, one of those right in my house. So I think Amy's against that one. I know the A3 option, they would basically bring traffic in from 23 into Ashley to get through 29, and then they would funnel, they would create a new freeway from 229 and Ashley over 271 somewhere. Um, I mean, clearly, I think that would be bad just having an elementary school over there. Um, I, I generally think, especially the three east options, as well as the two west, if, if they go and they smack down a freeway um, across a bunch of roads that our buses are running, we already struggle with the logistics of transporting all the students in the district. And if they go and run a highway and either cut off these roads and they become little cul de sacs lining up against the freeway, uh, I think that could definitely present some unique challenges for the district. Um, I've been following this for a while now, and I I think that the, the option that affects the district the least is obviously the Route 23 upgrade, the C1, or the, uh, yeah, the C1 option. Um, it's hard to gauge, though, without knowing specifically where it's going to go, exactly how the impact is going to be. Would okay. you want to have more detailed information as they move to the next steps? Okay. It would be nice. It would be easier to say if it is, in fact, going to negatively affect the district. Yeah. But I don't think they want to give that information yeah. out yet. What, yeah, I don't know, is it going to impact busing? Would it help it or hurt it, you know? Would it make busing more efficient for us? We have no idea. What, like similar to some area. of 23 where they, they do the cul-de-sac and they, they no longer let it cross the road. It would all depend on on how they how they do that. There's not many 206 square mile districts in the state. Sure it's already hard enough. Um, the other thing is, how might this impact the speed of development in the district? Would it speed it up or hinder it? Um, and I think that's with any of the options. With any of them, yeah. yeah. Um, if sewer comes along with any of those, our two decades of being right around 2,200 students will change overnight. I do think that in the planning, it's um, they've said that it would be between six and ten years before any construction begins. So we certainly will have some time to plan for that and monitor how the growth is approaching us. I know it's all in discussion phases, and there's nothing. The only the only one that you really have any clear of where it's going is the 23 to 229. That's the only one where you can really gauge, oh, this is a, a road that's going to be affected by it. Because then from there, it goes kind of in a broad swath out of 71. Okay. Correct, they would upgrade 229. Yeah. The others are all just out there. Cornfields. Mm -hmm. People's homes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. You live in the cornfield. <laughs> Oh, so. um, they in their met they don't have in their draft community impact they don't have consideration of school transportation so we would ask them to consider that and to if they can share more with us do so do you all want to draft a letter to them for comments as as the school district? I think you probably want to be notified of things are happening. Maybe if there's public meetings that someone should go. I think we've been getting invites. Yeah. And I. yeah. I think we're, we're on our list. That's why we wanted to bring it up so everybody knows. Yeah. Good. I think the resource, the facilities committee should. <laughs> 
consider it when I'm home. <laughs> So what I have is E3, um, we're worried about the traffic going by the, the school. Um, we want to have them review bus logistics um, and at least meet with us regarding challenges. C1, uh, without any more details, seems to be the least prohibitive to the district, but would like more details. We'd like the, hopefully a study on impact of district growth, um, and, and we may not be able to handle that growth with our current facilities um, if they're, they're expecting a lot of that. Anything else that I'm, I'm missing? If we want to draft that letter, I can get that and have you guys review it and, and get it sent to I think their public comment um, period ends February 28th, so we we'll want to make sure we get that submitted before that. I'll have something by the end of the week to send you guys a review of the weekend with the um, board update, and then I'll get it sent Monday if you guys review it. Yeah. I think that's all I had for discussion items. If you guys have any any others, I'm just trying to see your email and public comments. So we're going on to public comments. Oh, is that the one that was in here? From, do we say the name? Yep. Samantha Evans and Sunbury. I said, please choose here. Right here. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. That's cool. Yep. Um, good evening. So, tonight I'm supposed to discuss. One second, we'll have to give you a mic. I'm um, super loud. So. Okay, so tonight. I'm here to discuss uh, safety within our school district. Um, my son was threatened with a knife while riding the bus on January 24th. And after um, conversations with our principal and superintendent, still very concerned for my child, my children, um, the other children in our district, district based on the series of events that happened and the final solution for the child that carried the weapon and made the threat. Um, I have a couple questions without going into a lot of detail and bringing um, the drama of it. My question for the board members is, why do we have policies in place in our handbook and busing guidance that we, in my opinion, are choosing not to follow? Um, can you please communicate to me and the rest of the folks that are here your understanding of our policies around events such as what I've just described? What safety precautions do we regularly take to protect our children while in, in the care of the school and on the bus, and how do we educate our children? And then my last question for you guys is, over the last several years of my children being at Buckeye Valley, I heard an overwhelming amount of comments from PV administrators about children within the district that have a bad home life. And again, I heard this excuse as to why the child that made the threat was allowed to stay in the school without punishment or during their punishment for the threat. And what are we doing for these children? Uh, my concern is just as much for my child and my children um, to be safe, but for the children that are having a bad home life and committing these types of acts, um, how can we help them? So we're hearing your comments in their entirety for the first time. So I think we want to be responsive and be able to respond, but we're not going to be able to respond in entirety at this time. So we'd like to be able to feedback and communicate trans as transparently as we can. Um, what, you, what you can share. I, I can share that we are aware of the incident. We did follow board policy. Um, in, in per uh, what is in our, our policy is what we did follow. It does think that we're not able to tell her exactly what happened to the other, other child, but we are aware um, of the issue. Um, so again, we know it, we follow it, safety procedures. Um, we'll 
we don't have metal detectors or anything like that, but we um, we're hoping that we're we're teaching our, our students the best we can, and they came forward and, and let someone know. So that was at least the um, person that was was a victim was was comfortable enough to, to let someone know and, and to let an adult know. But it, it is a hiccup thing. The, the bad home life, I, I can't speak to that, but I can certainly get some details for you when we um, for the board on the response to that. So. But you're asking some things that we could follow up on and explain what our policies are and keeping kids safe. I've got the policies here. I can read them to you if you like. Not right. I just didn't know how, how. I had three minutes, so I wasn't sure. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah. It's, it's pretty clear that some of the policies, if not all, were not followed. The child actually committed um, five infractions, I guess you could say, against the code of conduct um, within this threat and, and when they brought the weapon, had it all day at school and then threatened my child on the bus. Um, so I've got all of that in front of me. I just wondered what your understanding of it was um, and why we're, in my opinion, not following it. I don't need to know what happened to the child. My children have let me know that that child was in school. Um, they passed that child in the lunchroom, um, had communications with them with, while waiting on the bus, waiting for the bus. That, you know, that entire week and since then. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying that uh, you didn't do the right thing. It's, it's scary to me that we have this many children in our district that have a bad home life um, and, and we're not helping them either. Um, so my son has not been followed up with since the day, the day after the incident. Um, nobody's checked on him. Um, it's just very concerning to me that these are types of things that are happening and it's not being put out there uh, for other parents to understand. I wanted to make sure you guys were aware. And see how we can work together as a community to make sure that our children are safe. I, I appreciate you bringing that to yeah. our attention. Um, that's stuff that, you know, we're hearing, a lot of us are hearing this for the first time. So um, we'll, we'll uh, discuss uh, how to share probably some executive session and uh, someone will follow up with you. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Mm -hmm. Ian Capwell. Hi, my name is Ian Capwell. Side note of what I'm here to talk about, um, this is extremely disturbing to me. Um, I have two children in Buckeye Valley East Elementary, and I had to learn about that not from the school. That is extremely troubling to me. Um, these type of things should somehow be publicized that there was some sort of incident. Um, my children's safety is my responsibility. Um, I trust and i leave some of that to you guys when i leave bring my kids to school so when i'm not informed i can't properly make decisions for my children's safety um, so it's, it's just kind of a side note to what i'm here to actually talk about is still school safety um, some of you um, there's three new members here um, you probably don't know me um, i in 2018 um, i introduced a program to the school board um, that would help address uh, uh, safety training and emergency response um, to faculty um, and administrators um, that would uh, be beneficial in these type of scenarios. Um, the program I introduced was the Faster Saves Lives program. Um, I won't read into what that is, just based on my time frames here. Um, in 2019, um, I did actually meet with Dr. Frolic and uh, Deputy Strausser um, to kind of talk over my concerns. Um, in the program and what kind of next steps we should do to move forward. Um, at that time, we did uh, talk about uh, uh, another public meeting. Apparently, there was one a couple of years prior to that um, that I wasn't a part of. My kids just started school the year before. Um, and we agreed that it sounded like a good idea to maybe do that again. Um, this is towards the end of 2019, 2020. Um, we weren't able to get things going right away. I mean, COVID hit. 
Um, and that fiasco happened, and I kind of figured I wasn't going to be hurt too much during the COVID period, um, so I let that go. Um, I'm kind of now back to try to see what we can do and bring this discussion back to light um, and to have these public uh, conversations and or meetings, um, experts from both sides of the topic um, to further discuss uh, really what the community members, parents would like to see happen at the school in regards to safety and emergency response. That's all I have. So you're requesting, want to consider having public forums around that topic? That was that was what was discussed as the next step. The next step. Uh, I I agree with that. If I do, I have a strong opinion on one side. I'm sure there's strong opinions on the other. I would love to discuss it. Um, I think I think the topic should be not just a small group of citizens. I think it should be what the whole, or at least the majority, of parents and community members would want to see happening in our schools. Um, so, like I said, it is definitely something I'm not trying to railroad through, um, but I don't know that we've had a good enough discussion on that in a, in a large enough uh, sample. I'll reach out to you. We can. Um get back with uh, Fred and I and, and Dr. Miller, who's helping out with that now, and we can kind of um, get that ball rolling. So. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, the one, the two males. Yeah. Um, uh, Amy Bertke, um, she's unable to attend, um, she says, at BB, we use a third-party counseling service in Tarot. I thought it was a nice resource to have until my recent discovery of their comprehensive sex education materials they provide at middle schools in Central Ohio, Westerville, Grandview, Dublin. Um, after seeing their program, I worry about their integrity and would never recommend anyone to use their services. Not an AD should be associated with and confident if families understood what their beliefs were, they too would be asking for a halt of the use. I would love to offer solutions, but I don't have any to offer. My hope is we will look at our contract and research other options. While Centero is here at BD, there should be a meeting of expectations of what type of resources are allowed to be offered, maybe even cleared through the school before offering the resource. Only making that suggestion if you were unable to get out of an existing contract. Um, are we contracted? So for how long? And she shares a video of the program that they offer in Franklin County. I, I watched that video. And I it's shocking. Questions. Yeah. Um, if we are just to, I guess, go on this. I called. Um, well, Mr. Ham talked to Erica Wood, who is our representative, um, and she is a. a BB resident has kids in the district, um, and she is head of our Centero program here. That program is not used in Delaware County or Morrow County. It was developed in Franklin County for um, a specific a particular school, and that that particular video, according to them, um, was inaccurate. Uh, they're willing to come in next board meeting to present to them what they're doing. It's just counseling services here. There's no sex education or comprehensive sex education happening. At Buckeye Valley through Centero, and it's not happening in Delaware or Marm County, but she is willing to come in. If that's something you guys want on for next month, we'll, we'll have her come in and explain it. I would love for that. Um, yeah, that we need clarification. Um, and they've had similar concerns, and they've had to do this um, presentation before, so they'll be happy to come in and, and explain what services they're providing us. Yeah, that would be great. And are we under contract with them? We are. We are. They they offer the the mental health services to our students. Yeah. That's our source for that. Yeah, that would be great if they could come. Yeah. yeah. On a side, I when I watched the video, I went online to try to find. I did not find what they're referencing in the video, so I did make it feel a little bit better that that wasn't there, and I was. Very glad to hear that it's not a Delaware County or Morrow County program, and that's the Centurion that we, we work with. Yeah. 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 Yeah
It's, yeah, it's, it's still a program that the company puts out, so that in and of itself is concerning for me that we're utilizing. My understanding is we have to put a program out. Like sure. That. My understanding though is that they developed it in conjunction with I, that group. I get so it. they still them. develop a program sure. like that that sure. it makes your eyes go. Yeah. Let's get the facts. Right. Get, right. Let's get the facts next month. Yeah. I think that would be very useful. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. And now, any more public comment? Um, we will need a motion to go into executive session. I just wanted to say yeah. one thing, if you don't mind. Oh. Um, I, I want you guys to know that we agree that we need to revisit a lot of these procedures as far as bullying and weapons and behavior in school and, and how things are treated. And I've talked to pretty much everybody up here individually, and they all agree that we need to make changes and we need to make sure that the children are secure. And even just before this meeting started, I was looking at our numbers um, online, and it's, it shows four incidents, which I disagree with as a parent. So what we define as an incident also. So I think you're going to find that we're going to be very open to doing the things that the community wants us to do. I have a general question too. This is, <laughs> um, you know, with the fair bus, did those same people get the split bus route emails? Is there a way that we can, if you have a junior or a senior that is driving, like you don't care about the bus route split? I, I don't care getting them, but I know that there's other people who are like, is there a way we can opt out of the bus route and stuff or not? No, um, because we use the um, power school. So if you live in the West District, then it's a West bus, regardless of where you're at. Um, so if it's a high school route, we can't separate East and West for high school. We got to send them everybody. If it's elementary, yes, we only send them to the elementary that that's affected. But I can't only send it to um, the quarter. You're not the first person brought up. We are trying to figure out ways to um, limit that. It would be great if we were fully staffed and we didn't have to send them out. Um, Anymore, but, um, it doesn't look like that's going to have anything to do with We're aware that that is a, a, a nuisance to, to some, and uh, we'd rather make sure that we're over communicating. And, and, yeah, um, no, I, I, I get it from that standpoint. I just didn't know if it was maybe an option to be like, hey, you know, I've got a. You can, but then you don't get any other gotcha. district communications. So. Okay, so it's all or none. You can so, choose to either, sorry, <laughs> Dr. Frolic, you can choose to opt into text or opt into email. So if you don't want the text to come directly to your phone, you can sign up for just email. Just email, okay, yeah. So you could limit it. And then speaking from my family where I have a separate cell phone number as opposed to my husband, we just limit to only one of us for getting those. They're not both phones for getting gotcha. the bus notification. So we can trim it, we can okay. scale it back. <laughs> okay. um, I was just curious. So if you reach out to either myself or Mrs. Andrews at the bus garage, we can help tailor that down as much as we can. Okay. I have a quick, um, something that was brought to my attention today, a middle school edition sheet for the Annie play. I'm just, I'm sure it's something that's going to get addressed in the future, use of pronouns, uh, what the purpose is, what the benefit is. My question is why are we asking middle school students what the gender <coughs> slash pronouns are? A middle schooler, feels that they need to use pronouns, I think that they will put them down without without being prompted. But for a sixth grader to be asked, what are your pronouns? I, I don't know. My name's whatever, Amanda. I mean, this is for the Annie High School musical coming up. And they are looking for some orphan girl, gender female, which I find, I mean, they're specifying gender, but why would they specify gender? They're being inclusive and open to all. Are they not going to let a boy cast for that unless the boy uh, identifies as a female? Um, and then really, why are they why are they asking middle schoolers what their pronouns are? Why is that being, I feel like, I feel like it's a slow push. They're going to be a very slippery slope. Um, and I want to, I want to protect our kids from that stuff. 
I'll look up right now. I missed it today. That was high school working, seeking middle school. Correct. Yeah, that was on the middle school audition form for the high school, high school musical. So it's a high school audition. On that same level, I would kind of like to know from the um, school administrators: um, Are we allowing a student to have a preferred name of? My name's April, but I won't be called Snowy. Is that a is that a real legitimate thing? Like my name's April, but today I want to be called Sarah. Like I feel like our focus is education, and you have a legal name. <laughs> are, are we? Is that happening? I guess before I go on my tangent of um, what what are we? I feel like that's a distraction. If I was in a classroom and someone, my classmate was being called, I'm making this up, like, you know, blizzard buddy or whatever, I would be like laughing, giggling, like I would be distracted, I wouldn't be able to focus, like I just feel like that's, we're getting off, we're allowing too much of this, I don't want to call it social emotional because I know some of these kids do have mental, um, you know, there is mental health there, but there have we have to have a, a strong firm line of what the school is allowing at at all levels and it, it's just i've heard things I, I can't confirm it that's why i would like to know from the administrators if this is really happening and what the reasoning is behind it and i truly feel like that's an issue and that that's being triggered it's falling in line with the same thing with the he she they them which I, it, that stuff doesn't matter to me, but like you, it, it is a distraction and we're here for for education. So I, I really want to, I'm curious. I I'll reach out to principals and see, I have not heard Snowflake or anything like that. I, I, and, and again, um, I some females that yeah. identify as male and have a male name that um, we're required to. And is that a legal issue? Okay, that's what I figured, but like, to a point of, you know, that's one thing on another level, but if I, I just. I, this is I, something that we want to have a discussion item at the next meeting so we can investigate and hear public comment on it. That would be great. Yeah. Now, you know, you say, is that a legal issue? I'm not really sure what you mean. If it is or is not a legal issue, um, I think wanting to be called something is one thing. I want to be called. Tom, okay, that's fine, but I want to identify it as something. That's a whole different thing. I don't think there's a place for that. I really don't. I, I mean, maybe I'm way behind the times, and maybe we're going to have 77 genders um, on the list somewhere, but I, I don't think teachers should be putting it on emails. I don't think students should be asked about that. I, don't, I think this is a political thing. If you, if you stop and look at it, who are the people putting these things on their emails and identifying one way or another? If they're all on one side of the political spectrum, then it's a political issue and it should not be in school. Here's the other thing that you know we just need to keep in mind. We have these strategic plans and we have all this stuff that we spend a ton of money on for our district that we really value. We take, I was a part of the strategic plan at one point years ago and I know how much community, teachers, administration, parents put their time and effort into this. And the one thing that they come out of that, the students want, is to be prepared for life, for the real world. That's like their biggest thing. It's like some of their fears that come out of that, like some of their goals, they want to be prepared. I just want to know from an educational standpoint is, you know, I submit my resume. I've been called Cupcake for 12 years and I submit my resume to get a job in the real world and, and uh, what are my odds getting the job with Snowflake on my resume? Depends where you're applying. Absolutely. Let's have a substantive discussion okay. when we can review the policies and about this next meeting. I would venture to say that even right now this is a somewhat controversial issue back on controversial curriculum. Um, finding a way to 
deep issues such as that that are deemed controversial, even on signature lines of elementary teachers. I mean, I, just, I think we should be aware to create a plan, a policy. I should have a, our legal um, opinion for you Friday. I think he was at a hearing this week, so I'm hoping he gets back to me um, tomorrow to let me know what, what his recommendation is and what we can do before and I'll that to you guys Friday. I'm sorry to drop that on you on the notes, but I literally found out like 45 minutes before I came to this meeting. So right. I think so it should, be, it should be a very short discussion. It should not be a long, drawn out discussion. You know, we have policy, it should not be controversial, it should not be political. It doesn't take a genius to figure it out. I'm not saying kids want to be all stuff, but are you doing that? Well, I think this deserves discussion and the opportunity for public comment at the next meeting. It wasn't listed as discussion from our agency. So. Now, I do need a movement to go into executive session. For those that are here, we will not be voting on anything afterwards. So you can see the lead. Um, we'll be meeting with K-12 about your contract was approved, and we'll talk about the superintendent search process, and there will be a posting on the web of what that process is, how everybody will be involved, and what the schedule is. Thank you very much. Thank you. I move that we go to executive session for ORC 121.22 to discuss G1 employment evaluation.